I was just a consumer of content back when there were only four networks, you know, and I was reading X-Men comics, which side note, that would be my dream project. So Marvel, please call me. Um, <laughs> but, would it be X-Factor or would it be yeah, X-Factor, X-Men? I don't care what it is, just call me. I like, I'm literally right behind having... you. I have all of those comics in plastic in my attic if you're looking to get any oh. edition. Or Lena, let's do it together. Yeah. <laughs> Are you people listening? Are you people out there and are you listening? Come on. Hi, and welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter, Director's Roundtable. I'm your host, Lacey Rose, and I am joined by Zach Graff of Ted Lasso, Elizabeth Moss of The Handmaid's Tale, Noah Hawley of Fargo, Stephen Canals of Pose, Lucia Agnello of Hacks, Lena Dunham of Industry, and Rick Femiua of The Mandalorian. Thank you all for being here. All right, I am going to kick off with a question for all of you or, or whoever wants to uh, field it. When was the last time you looked at a script and thought, how the hell am I going to do this? Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> what are the things, I mean, what, what have been the things that where that's been your sort of response. Ultimately, you figure it out because that's what you all do. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think um, it's, I always feel that when I, when I get a script, I think there's always that moment for me because um, I write as well where I finish a script um, and then there's the moment where I know I have to direct the script and, and make a movie or, or direct a, a show or whatever it might be and and everything shifts for me. It gets more real, gets more scary, <laughs> and I just, and every and and so that is a process for me that happens with with every project. And I read the script, and you go, "How are you going to figure this out?" Because that is ultimately it, it always seems impossible at the beginning, no matter how many times I've done it. <laughs> I was going to say when I when I got the episode two of Ted Lasso, which was the one I was going to direct, I'd never directed outside of the United States, and I didn't know really how. British crews work, they don't really want to do overtime and they don't really want to do more than 10 hours, which is something I didn't really know. And, um, you know, early on in a series, you know, it's not a well-oiled machine yet. So you don't know how fast you can accomplish that. And I read the script and it felt like an eight day shoot that had been crammed into five days with what I'd been told would be no overtime and 10 hour days. So I definitely thought, how the hell are we going to do this? And I and I went to Jason and Bill and said, I don't want to let you guys down. I'm, I move pretty fast, but this is kind of impossible to do in five days. And, you know, I think like any show, I think we can all attest here. Everyone's sort of figuring out how much you can cram into as few days as you have um, to do it. And I think they, they pretty quickly realized on Lasso they needed to add more days and have it be a, a six or seven day uh, an episode show. I think the moments that I tend to think, how am I going to do this? And I know that exact feeling that Rick is talking about when you're going from the moment when you're writing, which is this great, big, imaginative space, and you suddenly realize you have to execute something. But the moments that give me that, how in God's name is this going to happen thing, aren't the moments where you have to execute something sort of visually, um, visually uh, kind of you know, impressive because you know you have like amazing department heads and people who are going to rally with you on that and that you guys all are in it together. It's the moment when you have to pull off something complicated emotionally with three or four or five characters and you understand that every single person who's in the scene is going to have a different understanding of what that scene means and a different understanding of what it feels like. And you're like, oh, my job is to get four or five people with different inner lives to engage in the same emotional reality why did I accept this job? <laughs> yep, yep. But then when you get there, it's like the most beautiful feeling in the world. And see, for me, it's not, it's not about how am I going to do it? It's more, how am I going to trick this corporation into letting me do this? That's more <laughs> how I approach everything. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is just reassurance and telling them it's going to be great. And, and, um, you know, even even if you have your, your own doubts. So, so there's always that. Unfortunately, the director brain, especially in television, is is so mixed up with the showrunner brain and the writer brain and the you know all those 
brains you have to manage up and sideways and all that but um the actual making of the thing is the fun part Lucia, you look like you were uh, about to uh dive in no i was just thinking that the times usually that i'm like oh god how are we going to do this is when a first ad says how are we going to do this and i'm like i don't know <laughs> <laughs> somebody she has to tell me this is insane um because i think i kind of like my eyes are bigger than my i don't know shooting stomach or something um so i'm i'm always like oh no, this is going to be easy and great. I'm excited to just go and do it. But usually I feel like other people are pumping the brakes for me, which is good. I need that. But, um, but no, I mean, I think s- similar to, to what no one just said, like, I think that the actual, everything around the actual, like making of the stuff is the stuff I don't like, you know, the having to deal with all the, like, whatever the production meetings, all the stuff, obviously you need that. And everyone, that's how everyone gets on the same page. But for me, it's like, I just have to like, um, The way that I can describe it is kind of like my parents owned restaurants and my dad and my mom were like chefs. And like, that was the the part that they loved doing was the making the food for people, you know, but the stuff they had to deal with was like dealing with front of house and the inventory and like the permits and all that, like all the other stuff is the the thing you have to do so that you can like get the food, the beautiful food on the table for people to eat. So um, for me, I'm just kind of like all the other stuff. I just like, I, just want to get through it to, to get to the, to the dish, you know, that wasn't a great metaphor, but it's kind of <laughs> such, I was literally sitting here thinking what a good metaphor it was. Yeah, exactly. It was a bad metaphor. I was like, I was like her parents owned restaurants. If I was her publicist, I'd be throwing this all over this. <laughs> and also what a great metaphor. And I was just hungry. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth, for you, this this was all new. What were what were the parts that were scary for you? Ultimately, I've I've heard you say this was the one the most rewarding thing that you've done in your career. Um, but what was the sort of apprehension going in? Um, I am very new to it. Uh, I think, and I, I echo what Rick said. You know, uh, as far as yesterday was, you know, a time when I read something and was like, how am I going to do this? Uh, I had uh, originally on Handmaids, I was only going to direct one episode. I ended up doing three, but the first one I did, I had the choice between episodes two and three. And I picked three because of the story. Uh, It was a story I wanted to tell. Um, And then I sort of started prepping it and realized that I had these gigantic VFX sequences and rain towers and all of this shit that I had no idea how to do. Um, But, you know, I mean, I I say this a lot and I'm sure everybody here feels this way. You just don't do it alone, Um, which is I think the first big thing that I really, really discovered was how much you can lean on the the people around you and your DP and the different departments and um, that it's okay to say, you know, what do you think? It's okay. It's okay to, it's okay to ask for their expertise. That's why they're there. Um, So, I learned very quickly that it is a very much a group, a group effort. I've heard you also say that sort of talking to the actors and sort of directing the actors initially was something that you were a little nervous about. Yeah. That was the thing I was most nervous about. Why? Because I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to describe acting. I'm not, I never went to school for it. I have no language. I have no method. So I, I was, and I also, as an actor, I know how terrible it is to have a director come up to you and say the wrong thing and how much you hate them when they do that. And so I was like, (laughs) I knew what it was like to be on that side of it and have a director come up to you and say something. And you're like, okay, I don't know. I guess I'll figure out what that means, or I guess I'll figure out how to make that work. And uh, so that was the thing I was most nervous about. And then it was the thing that became my favorite part, of course. Um, You know, when you, I, when you have this incredible person, this incredible actor to go up to and, and you give them an idea or a thought or whatever it is, and you go back to the monitor and to see how it goes into them and comes back out was just the most magical thing I'd ever seen. Um, so that became the part that I enjoyed the most. But I, my first day I had to work with Bradley Whitford, who I had worked with when I was 17, yeah. um, you know, 20, 20 years ago. And I had to go up and give him a note. And I was like, how? how the fuck am I supposed to give Bradley Whitford a note? How am I supposed to do this? He's like my, he's, I, he's, I look up to him. He was very kind to me. He listened to me. He was very nice. This could actually be quite educational for, for everyone here. We have a few folks who also act. What are the things that, that actors hate hearing? I mean, to sort of play off of what you just said, what, what are those things? 
Zach, you've been there. Lena, you've been there. Obviously, let's get people to reference it. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you, this is going to be educational. The first, the first pet peeve that came to my mind when you asked that was, I like a few takes to just sort of get my footing and try some things. I really, I, I'll even say to a director, like, please, it's one thing if it's a blocking note, like the dolly can't see you if you don't hit your mark, but like, don't, don't give me acting notes on take one or two. Let me just, let me just find my footing for a second. Um, and then, and then I, if, once I find a place, then by all means, please come, come, come steer me. But that's one thing that, that I, that I, that I've taken as an actor to my directing. I let, I let the actors sort of, especially when you're just starting a scene. Another thing that, that came to my mind is, uh, I really don't like it. I, I love it when a director asks me wh- what order I want to go in terms of the coverage. If, if, if the scene is really tricky for me or whoever is, has the hardest scene, uh, I think an actor, I respect and like it when a director goes, what's your deal? Do you like to go first? Do you like to go last? Like, I, I think that is, that's really an incredible thing. Cause all of a sudden, if you've got a really hard scene and they've done one take of some master and now it's into your coverage. You're like, whoa, I don't even know what the hell I'm doing yet, you know? And I think the biggest thing that I, I love those cause those are just really practical tips. And those are things that I feel like I've learned from spending a lot of time around actors. And, and I think the biggest things that I learned in, in my twenties, both being on a show for a long time and, and also directing my colleagues every day was that my biggest job as a director, and I was lucky enough, I just, you know, shot two features in six months and felt like I was on the, in this sort of, you know, in this, and especially with the COVID of it all in this like deeply intimate boot camp with actors is like, your job is really to learn how each, it's not to have a sort of didactic one size fits all approach to, or a method to how actors work. It's really to get to know each person and what allows them to feel the safest and be most expressive emotionally and then try to foster almost lots of little mini environments for each person and so it's like you have a very specific relationship with each actor and it's almost like you're in one of those like french comedies running back and forth between you know five different people's (laughs) hotel rooms on five dates but it's like each person needs something really specific and then on a more practical level unless we're insanely rushed and it's like you know we have five minutes to catch the light and something needs to be done in the most specific way in which case I'll apologize and be super clear about why it's happening I try really hard always to again give people takes to find it themselves never to give people like you know a, a line read or like you know like a super specific body note body blocking note that cages them in and just to remember that like, just like my writing and directing is my self-expression, this is their self-expression. And so mm. they need the space to do that. Just like I need to be given the space to do this. I think that makes a lot of sense. Stephen, I, I wanna go back to you. I mean, you obviously just completed uh, this this project that was your baby. What uh, Was there a moment there? Maybe it was at, at the very end sort of wrapping up this thing that uh, that that made you nervous? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm to go back to the what you asked everyone earlier around challenges and and moments that made you scared. I I think that I've only ever directed things that I've written. So I think if I suppose it says something about me, I mean, like I probably should challenge myself to write more things that are going to make me really uncomfortable. But usually what I'm putting on the page are things I'm very excited to direct. Um, I think that this season in particular, what made things really scary and challenging was COVID-19. You know, we were filming in on location in New York City, which, you know, was ground zero. We arrived September 2020. There we were still figuring out safety protocols. New York was really in a place of, um, you know, lockdown for the most part. And so that was that was the thing that made it really challenging and, and made it scary for me. So that question of how we were going to film scenes had everything to do with all of the restrictions in the city. You know, I directed the our series finale and I have not one, but two protest scenes um, connected to, to AIDS activism and specifically ACT UP and 
both of those scenes, they had I had to have 250 to 300 people protesting, um, and the most that I could get from the studio approved was 40. You know, and so there was a lot of VFX work, and obviously that eats up your time. And uh, you know, I'm sure like everyone who's filmed in the middle of this pandemic you know, we went from having 12 to 13 hour days to having nine to 10 hour days. And so it really, it forced everyone to be on their A game. Um, I actually walked away from the experience less scared and, and more outside of the confidence that I have now, um, you know, standing behind that monitor and saying action and cut. Um, I'm most proud of, of the crew because everyone really just came prepared and brought their A game. Everyone was just really ready to work um, and also ensure that everyone's safety was there. And so it was a really, really magical, really beautiful final season experience. Sure. That's that's the thing is in this job, you have to be the sort of picture of calm. You have to sort of show that confidence, even if to, to Noah's point earlier, you, you don't always sort of feel it yourself. I am curious of when, when that's sort of been hardest. Noah, I, I know when, I assume last March, just as COVID was starting would be a case um, where you're sort of at this moment where you're supposed to be this picture of calm and yet, you know, you're there, there's a nearby crew member who I believe got COVID. You have this huge international cast. Sort of take me back and what are you actually feeling on the outside and or on the inside and, and, and how is it translating on the outside? Yeah, I was in Chicago that week to do some reshoots. Um, and I was really glad that I was there, even though it was personally frightening to, to because nobody knew anything, of course, last March. Um, but I was glad for the crew's sake that I was there with them making these decisions, because otherwise I'm just a voice on the phone. I'm the suit, you know, safely back at, at home. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we found out on, on the Monday that, that someone on an, an adjacent crew uh, had tested positive. Uh, we sent home everyone who had worked on that crew or gone to the rap party that weekend. And then you have to go, all right, well, the prop guy's girlfriend worked on that crew. So are we sending the prop guy home? And, and yes, we had Italian actors. We had actors from the UK. Um, you know, in that first night when we wrapped, I sent an email to the network in the studio and said, we have three weeks left. If we don't think we can get all three weeks, we should shut down today because there's no difference between coming back to get two weeks and coming back to get one week, you know, and, and, but it took three more days to get the battleship to turn, you know, because it's a lot of money. We send the Italians home to a lockdown country. We don't know when we could ever get them back really. And so, you know, we, we went on and, and, we didn't have a lot of information as, as to how it spread. You know, Tom Hanks got it, the NBA shut down, you know, all that stuff was happening on set while we were on set. And I just thought, well, what is the leadership that I would want that I'm looking to my leaders to provide for me, right? Which is transparency, accountability. Uh, and so I just tried to provide that to, to everyone so that, so that no, there was no secrecy I told them exactly what I'd learned. I pushed hard on on my bosses to, um, you know, to make decisions for people and not for money. And and you know, at the end of the day, they did. But it, it was a process. Yeah, it's, it sounds it sounds harrowing. I wanted to take us back to the, these shows. Rick, John Favreau calls you and says, "I'm doing this this Star Wars thing." What? Uh, <laughs> you are obviously someone I've heard you say who grew up loving Star Wars. What's that sort of mental calculus for you? Is it an easy, immediate yes? What are, how are you thinking about uh, your answer there? Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty immediate, right? <laughs> when, that, when something like that happens. And, and I, had, I had already, I was developing stuff with, with Lucasfilm prior to that. And, and that's how I got introduced to John. In um, television? No, on, on the on the feature side. And and so I was uh, you know, I, I but so the the Carrie Beck who runs the TV sort of talked and said, Would you I would be interested um in doing television, which I don't know, it's hard to call Mandalorian television. I don't know what the hell that <laughs> what we're doing over there. Um and I said yes, and I knew that this was starting to to 
to come along and obviously had read about it and, and knew John was, was developing this. And so, you know, I had a meeting with him and it was very chill and relaxed as he sort of walked me through his idea and the season. And there was already a bunch of artwork that had been done and, and the room was full of it. And so I'm walking into this environment in this world. And he was like, yeah, he was like, yeah, you know, um, we want to do the second one. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah, th definitely. Let me, let's, let's do this. <laughs> and that was, swim. yeah, that was kind of it. But he had, you know, he'd been a fan uh, of my work and, and I think what was to his credit. And I think what I think is a real testament to the show is he, he really wanted to bring in different voices and, and different energy from, uh, from not just the usual places and the usual suspects. So, um, so I think that first season and even continuing into the second, he's, you know, and, and Mandalorian has brought in really interesting filmmakers from different walks of life. I came out of independent film and there's others who are coming from Marvel and everything else. So I think that mix is what made it, you know, is what made it, is what making it so cool to be a part of. And I think it's, it translated to the screen. So, but my part was, was really easy because I'd grown up a fan um, and I was also a fan of John's work, you know, Swingers was like one of the things that inspired the wood, uh, you know, when I was writing that. And, you know, so it was, it was like a full circle moment of, of being able to kind of creatively do a lot of things and then have someone like John who both understood the, the big visual effects aspects of what these projects are, but also coming from independent cinema and understanding that you got to tell a story about people, sure. even if they're wearing a mask. <laughs> it's interesting though. I mean, you, you, you just said sort of you were encouraged to sort of lean in, have your perspective, your, your voice. That's not necessarily what these, on the film side, these filmmakers have had the opportunity to, to do. Yeah. Have, you, have you felt more of a freedom to sort of play in, in this sandbox on the, the television side than perhaps you would have if you were to have continued on, on the film side? Yes, I mean, it's hard. Everyone has a different process, but obviously on the feature film is such a, you know, specific thing with a specific process. And often that process is filled with pain because <laughs> it's just uh -huh. not for us the same in, 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 in all, you know, all kind of creative endeavors. Um, but this one in particular, I think, had a had a specificity about it because of John mm -hmm. and being a director himself, and I think understanding, you know, what that feels like uh, to sort of be in those shoes. And so I think for him, he 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 approached each of these episodes and each of these directors directing them almost as these were small films, and and he was like a producer producing these small films within this larger story of, of the Mandalorian. So each filmmaker really was, I won't say left to their own devices, because obviously we have incredible support, but in terms of creatively pushing where you wanted to go and have ideas and being receptive to it, and then have the support there on top of it um, to say, we're going to throw you know, all the money and resources that we have making a Star Wars project into it was certainly a feeling I've never had before, even making, you know, my, any of, on any of my projects. So uh, it was a very, you know, good and unique environment. And I think John was sort of at the top of sort of saying, this is, this is the kind of, you know, way we're going to make Mandalorian and I think again he's coming from his own experience but that experience was really incredible for for you know for me and I know for some of the other filmmakers as well. Yeah no I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Zach I want to turn to you. You probably have the most eclectic resume at this table though I think the guy who writes best-selling novels on the side uh, in, in Noah <laughs> probably uh, gives you some some competition but but you've you've directed you know, studio pictures, you've, you've directed episodic television, you're starred in long running sitcoms, you've done broad, I mean, you've literally done 
everything that Hollywood has has to offer. Where are you most at ease? Where are you, uh, what are the sort of easy yeses and, and the easy noes at this juncture? Uh, I think definitely directing. I, that's where I'm happiest. I, I, I love more than anything gathering a group of really creative people and, um, and bringing the best out of them. To me, that's what directing is. It's storytelling with people that are so much more talented than me in, in, in a lot of areas. Um, I, I, I hope that I'm a decent storyteller, but I, I get the honor of bringing on an incredible DP and bringing on incredible actors and down to, you know, every single department. And, and for me, I mean, it's a cheesy analogy, but I always think of it. It's like, I'm the conductor of an orchestra and I, I'm not the greatest first violinist by any stretch of the imagination, but I get to hire that person and, and be their cheerleader that have them do their best. Um, I just can't think of a, a more fun job than that because I love actors. I love um, photography and cinematography and I love music. And so to me, it's, 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 it's the most fun job. I can't believe it's a job. I can't believe we get to do it. it, it it's very stressful. Um, <laughs> I read somewhere that first ADs don't live very long. That's one of the reasons that the DGA has such good insurance. I don't know if that's true, but uh, I it's- that, uh, I read that too. It's stressful, um, but we love it, right? It's, it's, um, it's addicting. And, um, and when it works, it's, it's, there's nothing more gratifying. Can, can the rest of you relate? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> what about you, Elizabeth? Do you think this is something you will find yourself doing more of? How do you sort of balance that with with uh, your work as an actress? How are you going to navigate it? Yeah, if I'm if I'm lucky to, I would love to do more. Um, I'm going to be directing on the Apple show I'm starting tomorrow, um, which is exciting and a great honor. Um, I, I, I echo what Zach said. I mean, I, I do tend to feel, I can't, I feel it's about acting too, though. I can't believe they let you do this as a job. It's <laughs> the greatest racket in the world. Um, and it is incredibly stressful. I mean, when I directed, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was also the most rewarding. Um, so I, I would, I'm still learning. I have so much to learn. I'm still observing, even just being on this panel. I don't really want to talk. I just want to listen to you guys talk and try to learn as much as I can. But um, it's uh, it's been a very fulfilling experience. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it's working with the people. It, uh, like you said, Zach, it's, it's, it's the actors. It's working with the department heads. It's the DP. It's, it's that for me. It's not being the number one and only voice on set. It's, it's that collaboration that I really love. Has it changed once you went back into acting? Has it changed the sort of the, the way that, that you behave um, and interact and think about what it is you're doing with a scene? Um, no, I mean, when I first, like the first day, I think I did have to have like a, a slight moment of like, you're not directing the scene. <laughs> Um, but I honestly, I didn't realize this until I started directing. I've always thought like a director. I've always, I've always thought I was just a really involved actor. Um, and, and then when I got into producing, it was more of that. But when I, when I really started directing on set, I realized that, oh, I, that, I, that's how I think. I always have wanted to know the shots we're doing and all day, I want the shot list. I've always wanted to know where the camera is. I've always wanted to know what the other characters are doing and how those actors are thinking about their characters. I've always been very involved in, you know, the scripts and any rewrites and things like that. So um, it wasn't as crazy of a mental, tr you know, uh, transition as I thought it would be. Definitely a physical one, but the mental part of it wasn't that that different for me. Cool that you, you, that you say that because I always feel like. I, I grew up playing sports and basketball, so I feel like your your the actors, particularly your you know your your lead actors, are like your general, your captain on the field. Um, so the director on the field, almost in that we have to understand the entire story in 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 the same way, and 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 how we're making it and how we're going about it. So even though I don't think that we don't specifically say those thoughts or ideas or concepts or, or direction is, is directing, quote unquote, but I think we're all filmmakers and that's sort of how I, I look at, you know, the, the cast, the crew, 
everyone's a filmmaker and thinking about, you know, the final project, you know, the final product that we're putting out there. Um, and there's a give and take with that and has to be a full understanding if I'm asking you to do something that you know where it's coming from and vice versa. And so I've, I've always felt like that's, you know, we all have to feel like we're directors and <laughs> to some extent because we're, if we're all in, you know, have, the, have a similar vision where we're pushing in the same direction and need to all feel like we're, you know, we understand everyone's process in that. So even if we don't agree, we kind of understand where we're going. So I, I love that that's, when you said that, it immediately hit me because I'm like, that is, that's when it's sweet. That's when it's really working well is when all that's kind of functioning and people are all looking at it from that same way. And then when, when, the, when it does, then it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And the stress comes from trying to you know, get all those pieces to harmonize. But, but I love that idea. I love that. And that's one of the reasons I, I never on features take a film by credit, not any judgment towards people who do, but I just ever, I always feel like the idea of an, a film by credit is like, it's a film by all of us. And I may have ostensibly written it or directed it, but the idea of like that, that idea of like it being a film by the group and, you know, I write books and when I write books, I get to have a very quiet and private relationship with my own inner voice and a very direct dialogue with an audience. And there are ways to do that, but filmmaking is in its essence collaborative. And so it's always like essentially funny to me when I hear about a director who's like running around set and shrieking at people and it, because it's like, there was a great job for you and it was called staying in your room or playing concert piano or just any of the things that you can do by yourself. <laughs> With a group is probably not where, yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I think that's that's fair. You guys have referenced the sort of the, 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 the different sort of experts that you can bring in. One of the more recent ones is the sort of the, the intimacy coordinator. I know Jean Smart has, <laughs> has, has told, uh, but Lena, I, I guess I'll start with you. Uh, this was obviously not something that existed when you were making girls. No. I'm curious sort of <laughs> how it would have, how you think it would have changed the experience and, and, and now as you are working with, with young people in, um, on these shows where there very much is intimacy, um, how you think it has impacted it? Well, <clears throat> um, industry was the first project where I had an intimacy coordinator. Um, it was the first, I hadn't directed TV since girls and industry had, you know, its fair share of sex scenes. And I knew coming on, I had, you know, been in a dialogue with lots of my colleagues about the need for intimacy coordinators and what that was going to look like on set. So it wasn't, I wasn't surprised, you know, I was in the conversation with HBO about the fact that that was going to be a part of what they were doing moving forward on their shows. It wasn't something that was sprung on me by the network. It was in constant conversation with Kathleen McCaffrey and Max Holman, my longtime executives, about the fact that that was going to happen. And I was thrilled about it because, you know, I think people were under this misapprehension that somehow the sex scenes on girls were like a constant enthusiasm party. And they were things that I put into the script because I thought they were essential and I thought they moved the story forward. But sex scenes are embarrassing, anxiety producing, and embarrassing and anxiety producing at best and can be uncomfortable and traumatizing at worst if they're mishandled. And I worked very, very, very hard to handle them in a way that was thoughtful and um, supportive with my cast. Um, and everyone was in their twenties and everyone was friends. And it was like the fact that we all got out of that unscathed is, you know, in many ways, a miracle because it was there was no um person to go to to say hey i have a really really basic and silly question about how i strap these underwear on or i have a larger question about how this sex scene might make me feel or something it might trigger in me or a fear that i have and as close as you feel to your director or as close as you feel to your producer or as close as you feel to your co-star there are just things you might not want to say or ask and so our intimacy coordinator miriam became you know, I think I've heard some directors bemoaning, like, I know how to direct a sex scene. I, actors are my specialty. I could do this with my eyes closed. And we're saying things like, I know how to make a sex scene look sexy. It's like, dude, it's not about making a sex scene look sexy. It's about making people feel safe. And 
I was thrilled because I was like, I get to have a co-pilot in this experience. And my conversation with the actors can be this very kind of almost like um, this very uh, basic conversation about the physicality, which can be a separate conversation from the emotions. And then we can have a third conversation both with Miriam, you can have a conversation with Miriam and then we can have one all together about the boundaries of your comfort, what you need, institute safe words, have the things you need present for you on set. And it just creates an official, it just, it just makes everything official and kind of gives everybody, um, just gives everybody a chain of command, which every, which basically everything at work should have, should be written in the employee handbook. And so Miriam became a really essential part of my every day. And now on the movie that I just did, I had intimacy coordinators there. If a character needed to pee in a scene, I had an intimacy coordinator there. If a character needed to change underwear, I had an intimacy coordinator there. If a character was going to be doing a scene where she was, you know, a character was pulling up her skirts and there was a chance we might catch a glimpse of something just because you never know what anything brings up for anyone. And also that's a relationship that should just be fostered. Um, and also I've been in England and some of the words are confusing. Fanny means but here, but it means vagina in England. How am I supposed to deal with that? So it's really good to outsource some of that work. Lucia, you seem like you were sort of nodding at the beginning when, when I brought it up. Well, yeah, it was very interesting because we we did have we didn't have any particularly sexually graphic scenes, but we did have some intimate moments. So we had a, a really great um, intimacy coordinator on, but it was very interesting because Jean had never worked with an intimacy coordinator before. And um, while Hannah, who was very new, was, you know, was like, okay, great. It was just very interesting how they both, I think Jean was a little bit like, well, I know how to kiss. And we we're like, yes, no, we know. And it's just like, you just want to make no, sure. you the hot tamale you are. That's not the <laughs> you. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think it was uh, it, interesting where like for Hannah it was some, she was like, oh, of course, this is, this is how this industry works. But for, for somebody who's been working a long time, a long time in the industry, it seemed like a, it just like, it was so, it, it, of course it had nothing to do with her ability to, to sell an intimate moment, but it was just very interesting the different reactions to it. One was just like, well, of course, yes, this is how the industry works. But for Jean, it was um, surprising and, you know, she rolled with it, but I think she was a little like, Miffed. <laughs> sure. No, I, I think that's fair. It'll, I mean, that sort of speaks to the sort of generational piece that your show explores, too. I'm curious because you also wear another hat on this show as, as a writer and a showrunner. You are writing sort of for two different sort of comedic generations here. Are you more comfortable or at ease writing for one versus the other? And has, does, does that change uh, over the course of a season? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the, are you a Deborah? Are you an Ava? I am an Ava, but I do think that um, Deborah's uh, meanness can, I can maybe whip that out if necessary. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because I'm not 25, nor am I 69. So um, to be able to say like, well, here's maybe my point of view filtered through these different voices that are, are you know, separated by these generations is, you know, like it really is almost as if you have to channel, truly channel as if you are an actor, the character and then kind of write through that lens. Um, and, you know, like I kind of come from from the world of, of improv. So it's like, you know, we tend to in the writer's room often like just slip into the character as we're kind of pitching jokes or lines and, and whatever, um, which I actually think makes it like really fun and uh, a great way to kind of like pitch on, on on voice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been a really fun experience to, exp especially we're finding that older women are, are feeling seen by Deborah and feeling like, oh yes, it's like a body, cool, funny, badass woman um, of a certain age that maybe isn't reflected in, in TV or, or film as much as maybe should, should be. So that's been actually, to me personally, kind of one of the most gratifying things is being like, I like the show, but my mom loves it. And I'm like, okay, that's great. I love that, I'll take that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's been really, really rewarding. Never really kind of, I mean, I've written for like 13 year olds before because I, I worked on Babysitter's Club. And so that was also kind of different um, because that felt a little bit more like mimicry, but this way is maybe channeling hopefully a future me. You all have, I mean, whether it's intimacy, whether it's violence, whether it's it's something else entirely, you do have to 
get your actor sort of comfortable going to these dark places or in, in, in Elizabeth's case, yourself going to these dark places. How do you do that? When is that sort of most most challenging? Ultimately, I assume quite rewarding. I mean, Stephen, I, I want to start with you. It, it, with Pose, a lot of the, I mean, there, there's there's so much joy in this show, but you're also asking these actors to sort of relive some of their own traumas and their own triggers. How do you sort of get them to a place where where they are comfortable or they are sort of ready when ultimately you say action? Well, I think it it requires having really honest conversations with them about their experience, because the last thing that I or any of my collaborators want to do is re-traumatize them. Um, I think that we all, and by we, I mean, not only myself and the other four writers in our writer's room, but certainly the the cast i mean we have a lot of conversations where we're very intentional about what the story is that we are telling i think we all were hyper aware that we had an opportunity to be subversive and and to rewrite the narrative you know we've never really seen queer and trans people who happen to also be black and latinx on television really ever and certainly not in this way um you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind right now is at the very beginning of the very first season, um, I remember having a conversation with Billy Porter, who plays Pray Tell, um, and he disclosed his HIV status to me. And it was the one and only time that we ever talked about it until entering into our final season. Anytime we ever wrote any episodes, I was always hyper aware of is this gonna be really triggering for him? Is this something that is just, it's, it's gonna to be too much to ask him to portray this, this part of the journey. Um, and certainly as a director, I think that those conversations we had, um, particularly this final season ad nauseum, you know, it was really, really critically important for me that he felt safe, that he felt protected. Um, and we had a lot of conversations that final season um, and particularly while shooting the finale um, about his being the vessel. You know, he recently publicly spoke about, about being HIV positive for the past 14 years. And, um, and he's talked about that, like the, the importance for him as an actor of being the vessel that he survived. And that survival meant that he now gets to tell the story of all of these incredible people who passed away, who died of HIV AIDS and didn't get to tell their story. Um, and so I was really aware of the, the magnitude of that and then the high stakes of it. Similar for all of our trans cast, you know, Black trans women are the most disenfranchised community and our show center is not one but five, you know, Black and Afro-Latin trans women. And once again, it was just, it's always been my job to hold space for them and to listen more than anything. So even though, you know, we're as a director in particular, you're at a time crunch and, you know, shooting this final season, we have all of these restrictions and, you know, safety protocols. But for me, it was like, you know, it's, it's my time as a director. Like it's, it, these are my 12 hours or my 10 hours and I get to decide how I want to spend them. And so if spending my 10 hours means two of those are, are sitting with my actors to make sure that they're comfortable, then I'm going to do that. Um, and so there was a lot of, particularly this last season, a lot of just holding space and allowing them to voice whatever it is that they were feeling. Um, Cause I just never want, my cast to walk away from the experience feeling like that brought up a lot of difficult emotions for me or you just asked me to go to a really scary space and then once you hit cut we're on to the next scene or we're on to the next moment it's like i recognize what we're asking you to do and that is really precious and that's really special and so let's honor that sure that was so beautifully said Stephen, and like such a your show is so beautiful and has been so meaningful and important to so many to so many people for so many reasons. But it's so beautiful the way you sort of basically you just wrapped up the idea that you can ask people to do hard things, 
but they can actually walk away elevated and energized by facing those things instead of depleted and feeling sort of like a, like a husk of themselves, because so many people walk away from Hollywood sets feeling like they're, you know, we, we, we're talking much more openly about all kinds of abuse in Hollywood. But one of the big things that people walk away is feeling, you know, emotionally used and abused and like their inner lives have been sort of like snatched at and thrown away. And so the kind of like care before and after care you're talking about is the thing that keeps people feeling like they do this job for a reason. Yeah. And I, and I feel like the, for me, and I think for any director, the number one, your number one job is creating a safe environment for the cast, for the crew to feel open to be the, their best selves creatively, to feel open, to feel that if they express an idea or a thought, it's not going to, you know, cost them their head. Um, mm -hmm. To feel safe. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I hear a lot about like, you know, what great directors are decisive and they're this and they're that, but I feel like my number one job is creating a safe, creative environment. Um, and I think that's what we have to do. And once you do that, or if you're working to do that, then when you ask questions about, well, how do you get an actor to, to tap into this? Or how do you talk to someone? Well, it starts from a foundation of trust and that you created an environment where they feel um, like they're heard. And that, and I think you set the example as, as a director all the way down to your, your PA or office staff, how you treat everyone, everyone sees. Um, and so if you, if you understand that, um, that that environment you create for, you know, the, the so-called lowest person on the totem pole, right? Um, if you're worried as much about that, then everything else is going to feel and, and create the kind of environment you want so that you can do the more daring thing. Because you're right, when it gets to, it's an hour left and we got, you know, we only, when we're losing the light, um, that's the moment where everyone has to go, I trust you, I trust this environment. And even though I might be, I might have to fly blind here, I know that you're going to lead me in the right direction because we've created a trust. So I think that for us, I feel like the theme of what's been, we've been talking about today is sort of creating safe environments so that creativity can really flourish. And I think once, if you're, if you have a mind to that, then it helps it helps with everything you need to do. And so I, I don't understand, or I, I, you know, filmmakers that feel otherwise, but obviously everyone has their own process, but I, I feel like that's the most important part of everything that we have to do. Can I say though, I think that at times though, that can be really difficult for some yeah. people because when I think about the experience on Pose and I know I have the same, and in a different way from the cast, obviously, because I'm not in front of the camera, but I carry a lot of the same um, issues I think that they do, which is being a, you know, for me being a queer Afro Latin person, like I'm used to walking into spaces where I'm already viewed as other and where I'm having to prove my worth, where I'm having to prove why I'm in that space. And so it was really critically important in particular for the ladies on the show who happen to be black and brown, who happen to be having a trans experience to say, you have the agency to speak up and say, if this is not a comfortable environment, if something isn't working. Like it was just, it was really, that was important and hopefully the ways that, that we respected them on set, that that'll then um, go with them into whatever future projects they're, they're going into. Because the reality is, I think that, you know, particularly in this business, which is, you know, it's very white, it's very male, it's very cis, it's very straight. You know, if for these women who happen to be trans, who happen to be black and brown, it's like, I'm used to being in spaces where I'm not being heard, where I'm not listened to, where I'm not respected. And so I think collectively, all of us working on Pose all felt it was really critically important that we change that, you know, at least on our set, like you have a voice, it is going to be heard. What is it that you need? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. And I think that it gets back to one of the reasons that I was so thrilled to have an intimacy coordinator on set is because I think you encouraging them and letting them know that their voice is actually going to be heard 
is a reminder of how many sets people go, you know, things happen that make people uncomfortable. And later producers or directors say, you could have come to me or you could have talked to me and you could have spoken up. And they don't recognize the sort of like implicit silencing power that just their presence has. And that how hard it is for so many people just spend their entire young lives being trained not to speak to authority. And I was a kid with a rad feminist mother who constantly basically told me to go into school and tell the principal to fuck off. And it was still really hard for me to speak to authority when I first started working and it's still hard sometimes. So it's amazing that you create that, that energy on your set where people understand that they can actually reject circumstances that aren't comfortable for them. And, and this theme of safety, I think it's, it's, meaningful that it's coming out right now because as you said so beautifully before Stephen like this year crews had to trust each other more than ever because it was a reminder that we must really love doing this job if you know in the circumstance that Noah described with the you know COVID positive and you know tons of people who would probably love to flee back to their homes in other nations were all staying to finish this sort of non-essential work because <laughs> it's not meaningful. Yeah, no, risking risking your lives and, and others, sure. Elizabeth, you obviously have been on, on both sides of this now. You've both, as an actress, had to go to some really, really dark places on the show. And then you stepped into the sort of director role and had to take yourself there and, and others as well. What had your sort of experience on the acting side <laughs> How did it inform how you wanted to uh, make people comfortable? I mean, as far as the other actors, I think my my greatest strength as a director is my strength as an actor. Um, you know, whether I think that's what I bring to the job that I'm that I'm best at. Um, and so I, I feel like as a director, what I want is in a director is you know you can't be a hard surface, you can't be a wall, you have to be something that bends you have to be you have to be padded you have to be able to <clears throat> an actor comes to you they may be in a bad mood they may not like what you're going to say they may have something to say back to you and you have to let it bounce off you and you have to be able to kind of take what they say and and absorb it and be able to help them with whatever they're struggling with whatever they're trying to figure out actors can be very vulnerable and they can be insecure and they need you to kind of be protective for them I think we've all sort of said it in one way or another creating those like you said Lena those mini environments creating a safe space is is the most important thing for an actor um, and every actor is different you know there's some actors that I mean I'm the kind of actor, you can say anything to me. You can tell me to go stand on that mark. You can tell me my hand on my head on that line. I'm like, cool, like, great, <laughs> let's do it. There are some actors you can obviously never say that to, and you have to be much more exploratory with, um, and you have to know which actor that actor is in order to, to speak to them, in order to get the performance that you both want. Uh, as an actor myself, directing myself, I mean, I've always... Like I said, I kind of discovered this more when I was directing. I've always thought like a director, which I didn't realize I was doing. I've always watched my own performance in my head. I've always thought about what lines we would be using and when we would cut and how long we would stay on that close up. Um, and uh, so that wasn't so hard. The difficult thing was, was taking the directing hat off and allowing my, I had to consciously when we rolled take that director hat off, just be an actor and just fully invest in, in the performance. Um, and I, I got a lot of great mm -hmm. advice from a lot of directors that I asked, um, but I asked Ben Stiller for advice and, and as an actor director, and he gave me actually the, the one that I use the most, which was to allow yourself to, to have that extra take if you need it. it. As any director here knows, time is the ultimate enemy. And, you know, you're always like, someone's always looking over your shoulder. And the worst situation to be in is when it's you and you're watching your own, you have to watch playback and you're watching it and you want to go again. You think it could be better. You want to try something and, and you're sort of screwing yourself because you have to move on. Um, but allow, but going, it's okay. I'm going to go one more. I'm going to go one more just as an actor was something I had to, I had to, every day remind myself. Sure, sure. 
I want to open this up a little bit and, and, and talk about sort of career navigation for all of you. What, what, um, what's the sort of the dream type of a project? If, if a, an executive is going to call and say, Hey, Lucia, Hey, Zach, Hey, Lena, Hey, Noah, can you do X? We'd really love you to tackle Y. What is the kind of thing that you, uh, you're hoping they say? What's the sort of dream that has not been perhaps handed to you yet, but, but you'd really love uh, to be considered for? Zach, maybe I, I start with, with you. Um, well, I think it, I think, I, I don't know if I can speak for all of us, but I think it changes depending on what you've just done. Uh, sometimes you, 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 you go, okay, that was awesome. The experience I just had, but wow. I, and then you see something that inspires you and you go, wow, I'd love to do something like that. Um, what's that in, in this moment now? Well, I made a short film um, uh, that was a period comedy. Um, it, it was a really cool assignment. Uh, Adobe uh, came to me and said, make a very long story short, it had a competition for college kids and the college kids would design a movie poster. And then the prize was that I would write and direct a short film <clears throat> inspired by the poster, which was about one of the coolest things ever because they had money too. So it was like, and a budget, it was incredible. But so I wrote this just sort of sweeping period comedy, uh, t 10 minutes long. And that made me kind of want to do that. I'd love to do something. I'd love to, to do a, uh, a period, uh, a big scale. Someone's got lots of money, big period comedy. That's what I'd like to do. I'd watch it. But I just, I, and it was really fun. I can't recommend it enough, Zach. You saw it. Oh, thank you. No, no, I did see it and it was great. <laughs> I did, but I said, I just directed a period comedy and I can't recommend it enough. I think you can oh. go do it. But I did see it and it was fantastic. I loved that Apple detail. Thank you so much. <laughs> Noah, what's, what's the thing, what's the, the call that you haven't gotten, but uh, are really hoping you will? I mean, I've gotten a lot of calls. I know. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, the, the real question is, are you sure that you want me to do this, right? Because, um, you know, what I'm interested in is, is taking the story where it wants to go or exploring the medium uh, of film or television or, or, or fiction. Um, you know, we're all commercial artists, right? And so we have this process we have to go through, which is the art process and the commercial process, right? And, and you know, if the network of the studio can ask you to be more commercial, I think you should be able to ask them to be more artistic, right? Which is to say, um, none of us know anything about what's going to work and what's not going to work. But, but um, you know, I mean, I'm going through this now. I'm, I'm doing this alien show for, for FX, right? And, and you know, what's, what's interesting to me about that is not necessarily what's interesting to everybody else, right? And, and you know, I do a lot of reinventing. And, and I, I, I think I, what I'm good at is figuring out what a movie makes me feel and creating that feeling for other people. But I can't recreate what it makes you feel, you know what I mean? So you, you get into a lot of those conversations where it's clear that what I think Fargo is or Legion is or Star Trek is, is not necessarily the movie that you saw, mm -hmm. you know, which is always an interesting part of the process. Um, and, so I don't know that there's there's one specific thing, you know, I, I, I have found with with the franchise stuff, which I've flirted with, is that people, they don't have a good sense of humor about that stuff the way they do when there's less money involved. You know, the more the more money, the more there's a brand, the less like, oh, yeah, that'd be ridiculous. We should definitely do that. That's not a conversation that you tend to have. Um, so, yeah, so I'm trying to figure out, like, is it worth pushing that rock up the hill or is it better to just try to do things that are less important to to the companies you know yeah I, I love I love that no because I feel like what what I really connect to with that is just the idea of being like it doesn't really matter what the medium is it's just like where is there the most amount of play and the most amount of like freedom and being able to say well here's the thing I want to say whether it's a web series or whether it's a huge right. film and so it's like to me that's always the thing I want to be like doing next is like what is the most like exciting fun thing that they're just gonna let me and all the people that I want to play with 
play and and who you know it, to me i wouldn't mind a little more time to play but otherwise yeah like, you know that's that's the fun of it Did you ever get that though i mean i mean it's funny uh, from the tiny budget things to the big things. I wonder if Chris Nolan doesn't have enough time. I mean, I, does it never, this, this, never out that he has enough time. <laughs> Nick, you're someone that, that the internet has a lot of big plans for. I, I think if you do a current <laughs> Google search, they would like you to do black Superman and blade. There's, there's a whole number of things that they would like you to, you to do. Um, are those the types of things that you want to do at, at, at this stage too, or to sort of Noah's point, does the sort of studio tent pole movie come with all those sort of cooks in the kitchen and the sort of the, the fear piece? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I the first film I saw was Star Wars. I'm working on a Star Wars project now. Um, so one, so on, on many levels, I'm already doing doing that and, and enjoying it. Um, um, but yeah, there, I, I'm in this place where it's like, I want to, I want to make great stuff that I, that, that, that really just, you know, speaks to me. And, and that might be something like Blade or, or Superman or, or, or Star Wars or whatever, but it also might be, you know, something I'm, I'm writing. I, 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 I just, uh, I, you know, I was fortunate, uh, I think, like Lena, to, to sort of have started when I was really young. And my first film was, I was 24, 23 when I wrote it and 24 when I directed it. So I've been doing this, you know, for like 20 years off and on. And so I'm just at a point where, you know, um, those things might happen and it'll be incredible, but I, I'm, I'm enjoying that I can make and be creative and be creative with people that I, that I enjoy being around, which I think for me is now becoming more, more important than the, whatever the, the shiny toy or brass ring might be out there is I just want to work with cool people. And I think this past year of, of sort of that we've all had to deal with has just reinforced that. And so that might be in something like that, but it, and it, it might be on television. It might be in, you know, uh, gaming, it could be anywhere. I, I'm not one that, that feels like there's, there's a specific medium that cinema has to be, be a part of. I think it's all cinema. So I, I'm just trying to, to do that. Um, but always flattered in, 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 in when I see some of this stuff <laughs> that, that, that folks would think of me for the, that I might be a good idea. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I want to end by, by asking the rest of you this. What, what's the thing that, that you wish someone could have told you at, at the beginning of these careers, whether you were, you know, you were a lowly writer, whether you were starting out on, on a Scrubs, whether you were on the, a set of Mad, of Mad Men, before that, West Wing. Um, what are the things you wish you, um, you wish someone could have told you that, that you, that you clearly know now? I'll just say to, to, to savor it. I think that, you know, I look back, you know, when I was a waiter when I got scrubs, I, I, I had aspired to do, I had such big eyes and big plans, but I, you know, I look back now and, and I guess I would tell a young person starting out that it's so rare that you actually get to do the thing, you know, so much of this career path of being a, a freelance creative is pitching and writing and struggling and hustling and praying and uh, crossing your fingers and lighting a candle that it happens. And so when you're actually getting to do it, when you're actually, when the trucks are actually there on the street and they're unloading the gear that, so just savor every day and be so grateful that you get to do it. Because like I said earlier, it, the job is stressful, but it feels too good to be true that we get to do it. I, I can't believe that it's a, it's a career. And uh, so I would just tell young people that, that, that uh, you know, there's an old expression that I always, uh, stuck with it related to acting, but it applies to directing too, which is that you, you get you get paid for all the auditioning and all the stress and all the, it's <laughs> getting to do the thing that should be free because you can't believe you get to do it. The money that you, that you sometimes make should be for all the late nights that you're up worrying if the thing's gonna actually happen. What about the rest of you? What, uh, what do you, take us out. What do you wish you, uh, what do you wish you could have told yourself that perhaps made, would have made the path uh, a little easier. Well, I used to tell, um, I used to think that 
that the advice was don't take it personally, right? Like someone likes your script, they don't like your script, it's not about you. But then, you know, I was having a conversation with Jason Schwartzman on Fargo. There was a scene that he was nervous about. And I said, well, picture the most iconic scene in the most iconic movie, right? It's I could have been a contender or Sigourney Weaver, get away from her, you bitch. Or <laughs> I was like, all those scenes were filmed on a Tuesday between 6 and 10 p.m. Do you know what I mean? Like they just came in and got to work and they made something amazing, but they didn't go, OK, this is the moment we're making the iconic scene it really has to be you just got to show up and be open to the experience of it and and not worry about the clock and you know one day someone will be looking at this scene and think oh my god they must have had like nine days to do this scene and inside and out it's like no we had five takes and we just had to get it done so and in the case of i could have a contender uh, brando wasn't even there for rod steiger's coverage i read <laughs> that's wild <laughs> i love it i want to echo I want to echo what what Zach was saying because I I think you know for me I whenever I think about where I'm at now in terms of my career I always reflect on being a young boy who grew up in housing projects in the South Bronx in the 1980s where you know New York it was such a bleak time for New York City and you know my parents were young we had very little resources we had no money you know, like this, what, where I am right now, you know, sitting here on a Hollywood Reporter roundtable with all of you, wasn't even a possibility. It wasn't a dream. Like, and there was no one in my community who was aspiring to, to be in Hollywood, to, to be making film and television. You know, I was just a consumer of content back when there were only four networks, you know, and I was reading X-Men comics, which side note, that would be my dream project. So Marvel, please call me. Um, <laughs> but, the X Factor, or would it be yeah, X Factor, X Men? I don't care what it is. Just call me. I like. I'm right there behind you. I have all of those comics in plastic in my attic. If you're looking to get any oh. edition, or Lena, let's do it together. Yeah. <laughs> are you people listening? Are you people out there? And are you listening? Come on, like call me up. But you know, I, I just to go from that to here. You know, I I wish that. Um, especially now in my forties, you know, I think about all of the time and all of, you know, how long it took for me to get to this point. I just wish that then there had been someone who would have just said to me, it absolutely is a possibility it can happen. You know, my parents were great about pushing me and encouraging me, but you know, I think that's what parents are supposed to do. Um, but there's no, there's never any guarantee in life. And so, you know, I just, I, I try to be that beacon and that light for young kids who are still growing up in that same environment now, just to say, if I can do it, you absolutely can do it also. Just believe in yourself, surround yourself with the right people, you know, work on your craft, the doors will open. Steven just said he was in his forties. I fully thought you were like a 24 year old prodigy. That's what I think happened this whole time. I was trying to like piece it out. I was like, so he started his career around age 16. Now he's I was like almost Googling. And I was like, that's not right. <laughs> but I was like, it'll be so obvious. Slip of the tongue. Okay, we'll talk about this later. Um, you. In your Marvel writing room, writer's room, yes. Yeah. Exactly. But it was beautiful what you said. And I think the other thing that I really try to express, especially to young women and um, like to young women, queer people, people of color who I talk to, who I think have the experience of coming into this world and thinking, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe they're letting me work. There's not going to be very long that we're allowed into this world and we better shove ourselves into the door while we can, because there's been that scarcity mentality for so long is that suddenly people feel as though they have to say yes to every opportunity that comes their way because like, this is the moment. It's the moment mm -hmm. that we're going to be trendy. It's the moment that we're going to be allowed into the space. I know that when there was like the gold rush of shows called Girls and people thought it was cool to be a girl. And there was like six months where there was the poster for two broke girls, girls and new girl. And I was like, better seize the girls moment before I'm <laughs> back working at the children's clothing store for the rest of my life. And but it's also as beautiful as it is to be open and say yes to life. It's also really important to have boundaries because no one is going to create boundaries besides you. And like your artistic life has to involve space for you. And also 
this is a business that's an essentially selfish business. Everybody is out like trying to create a career for themselves out of nothing. And that's the magic of this business. And it's also the terror of this business. And so trying to recognize that it's okay to create some boundaries for yourself and to stop and to allow yourself to take to take some space and you're not going to lose the momentum that you've created for yourself just because you say no or allow yourself some room for growth is something that I try to communicate to really every young person that I talk to because I really wish someone had communicated it to me. Yeah, the frustration, as you know, you your younger self wouldn't listen to you anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, my, even if you gave them the, the good advice. That's probably, that's my younger probably. self would have been like, you're dumb and not that cute. Do you have any pills? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're Adults. like, they're uh, like yeah. you should have taken better care of yourself, older Rick. You know, <laughs> <laughs> how about that? You know? Exactly. All right. Well, we have officially lost the light in London. So I uh, I think we'll we'll end it here. But thank you all for, for sharing your, your time and, and your story. It's, it's so nice to see all your faces. I want to say it's thank you. This is to be here with all of I, you. As directors, we don't normally get, to, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you don't often get to sit around and talk to other directors. So no. it's been really cool. I really thank you for having us. So nice yeah, to meet you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. It was such a pleasure. And such a huge fan of everyone. So keep making great things so I can go be entertained. <laughs> Put it back at you. All for the coziness. Bye. All right. Bye, buddy. Bye.